China's disease. They reckon on 30% incapacitated with it. Everybody calls me joiner because I started off to be a carpenter at the pit in 1911. I was only 13 year old then, and they had me chasing about underground until I became a pitman, the same as everybody else. I would never have become a carpenter yet. they call our pit. It's the farthest north in the whole of England, and there isn't another for 36 miles. It's fine open country, and we've got a magnificent view of the Cheviots on a clear day. Conditions aren't easy at Black Hill. It's a thin coal seam, and it slopes very steeply. We've got a water problem as well. The pumps are kept going day and night. It's not a big pit, but it's very unusual because we sunk the shaft ourselves. It's only 40 fathoms deep, but there aren't many pitmen that can say that all the same. Aye, we made that pit in the war. They wanted coal then, all right. We just had to leave the old Thomason pit to go to Rack and Ruin at the edge of the village. It just shows you what can happen to a pit. Black Hell's been doing all right though, and the village is a different place since the war. The coal board got the council to build 60 new houses. Very nice. A big contrast to the old Scammerson. Deputy Rowe. Electrician's Rowe. They call this the sink after the other old pit at the back. There's dozens of them dotted about. There's been coal got in Scanniston since Queen Elizabeth I. So the vicar was telling us over in the vicarage. Bob Chell, he showed us an old program from when they opened the church. 1843 it was, while one of them said, Poor colliery assembles a large body of laborers, and these can never be depended upon without moral and religious instruction. We colliery proprietors have great pleasure in aiding endeavors to provide them. <laughs> I wonder what he would have said if he could have seen us now, Pittman as magistrates, and such as that. It's very good land around these parts, and the farmers are doing real well, enough to keep a blacksmith going. The area is full of historical associations. There's a Roman road, flooding fields only 10 miles away, and the old knights used to ride through here to Berry Castle. I think they might have given the place its name, because they were always impressed with the screaming of the gulls. Screamers down. Somebody else is doing all right as well, according to the advertiser. But of course, the biggest majority of us are pitmen. Take Tommy Mason there, 50 years in the pit. A very quiet chap. His wife. Everybody calls her Sally. She's a great one for committees and all that kind of thing. Ali Gibson. He keeps the local, as well as walking in the pit. John Richard Woods, no stranger up there either. John Cole. He's a lay preacher. Tom Richardson. He's a deputy in the pit. And his missus. They've got a son, a pitman as well, and their youngest, Muriel. She's a very clever artist. She often draws miners. She signs the pictures with Chinese words that mean one world. Now that's a strange thought for a pitman's daughter in the Thumbund. Then there's Dick Thompson. He runs the welfare in his spare time. Matt Locks, the caretaker down there. The welfare is the hub of the whole village. Dick's a magistrate and a big chap in the church choir, a parish councillor as well. He's had something to do with this new street lighting. Some of the pitmen live in Berwick, Tommy Gibson. 
He is what they call senior overman at the pit. The union secretary, Gavin Drummond, and a good many others. Of course, you couldn't call Barry Kermine and Town. It's a royal bow. Very quiet. In fact, some folks still think it's in the Middle Ages. But a big proportion of our pay goes in the town, and some of them are beginning to sit up. There's other fuels competing more and more against coal. The government plan to increase the total use of energy. Well, it's like a lot of plans. Now they've got it, they don't want it. Stocks are getting bigger and bigger. First the coal board and the government get their heads together. Then the unions called in. the manager of Black Hill? No, it's not here. This is the mining engine room. This is the Newcastle Journal. Have you heard the news? No. Is that you, Dick? Yes, bad news. They're going to close the pit. What? A newspaper man just rang us from Newcastle. 36 pits altogether. Good God. That was the afternoon shift, of course. I was on day shift myself and had it on TV. I went down to the welfare and told them there it was ten days off Christmas. They couldn't take it in at all. The government and the public's been chasing the coal board for more and more coal, shouting about absenteeism and one thing and another. Us old stages could see some short time in the orphan, like the bad old days. But nobody ever dreamed of this. We've always been led to believe that as long as there's a village, there'll be a pit. The effect couldn't have been any worse if they had dropped an atom bomb on the place. It knocked the stuffing out of us for a whole week. Then the reaction was, the union will fight it out. But the vicar disagreed. He reckoned that involved far more than just the miners. So he called a mass meeting for Sunday. myself as a former union president. Mr. Chairman, I propose we do the same as when they tried to close the pit in 1936. Form a defense committee and fight. We're all affected and we must get people to serve on it that's got some standing in the community. I find it very difficult to attend meetings on Sunday morning, which is the normal time of meeting. Uh, I arrived at the first general meeting, which was held in the village, and when I got there, uh, the meeting was practically over, but I was told that I had been put onto the committee, uh, and, and quite naturally, I suppose, because what goes on in the village affects me. These are my people. Uh, everything that affects them affects me in some way or the other. Major Smear was on it. He owns the advertiser. Gavin Drummond and Clarry Smallman for the union. The mayor, Tom Evans, the shipbuilder. The day it appeared in press, Gavin Drummond phoned and asked me to a meeting. Very town council were thoroughly behind us. The chairman of the rural council was co-opted, Colonel Davidson. Dr. Sadler, Dick Thompson and his brother. He's a retired miner and a county councillor. And of course, Tommy Gibson as the mining expert. They met in the welfare and the first thing was to collect all the arguments against closing the pit. 750 tons of coal each week are essential to our economy. The cost of bringing this long distances might bankrupt smaller farms, and our unemployment has already doubled the national average. We've got to remember Black Hill is a young pit. There are thousands of tons of coal still down this pit. My colleagues on the council and I think it very cruel to close Black Hill in this way. Miner here is fine type of chap, but nearly half are over 50. They cannot move with their families at that age. If they do, what will happen to the new house we've built at the coal board's request? Who will pay the rates? 
Then Lord Lumpton, OMP, came in. He led a fact-finding delegation to headquarters in Newcastle to present all these arguments. I was on it, and they said, we're very pleased to see you, but we can tell you before you begin, the answer is no. Our first clash with bureaucracy. What we want is a scheme for Black Hill, something to make the coal board sit up, but practicable. Reorganize the pit from top to bottom and make it pay again. It's a first-class idea. If we are prepared to make sacrifices for this scheme, it might set a completely new tone for the whole industry. Of course, it was Tommy that had to walk out the details. Many of the time I've sat up on Friday night and drawn plans for next morning's consultative committee. But this is something different. I've got to reduce output to meet local needs only and cut manpower, wages and costs until we show a profit again, all without violating the National Wages Agreement. You don't want much, do you? From my own experience as a shipyard manager, I impressed on these men at the very outset they should do nothing contrary to union rules. It might jeopardize the whole future of this plant. It was absolutely unprecedented for a lifelong union man, but Tommy got stuck in it. Dip work is a hopeless. And our only hope is to get into eight and nine north and into three south rise wagons. That's the only place where we can make it safe. And if we move 30 yards up the line, yeah, to protect that new lobby, that'll give a you know, 90, 95 yards of length of face there, seven yards a week. That will last me about 14 weeks. That will give way 100 yards of high side going to the rise and 40 yards of low side with the development phase going still going in. And I'll still have to leave 40 yards of power in there for that water all day, all the way in there. Eight months in number eight. Down that would last 10 years, you know? Of course, the wheels were still turning while Tommy was born on the midnight oil there. Regular as clockwork. You couldn't seem to grasp that one day soon they might stop. And then another plan was thought of. Town clerk and I studied the Nationalization Act. We saw the minister can increase the size of pits worked by private enterprise. And we brought out a scheme for our member of parliament to raise in the commons. Miners would never support anything against nationalization, but it made a splash all the same. We were all alone with newspaper men and one thing and another. We wanted publicity, but it cut both ways. Union headquarters. Dear Mr. Meehan, National Press reports. Got that? The reports that I am raising £60,000 to buy Black Hill and contemplate changes in the Nationalisation Act have no truth whatsoever. Yours faithfully, Gavin Drummond, Union Secretary. While Garvin and his wife were sorting things out with the union headquarters, Tommy was having a rough time with his plan. I got that 40 yards of face off, I did. First and second left, anyway. And he had peeled that two mile about. We got an economist in to check it, Gordon Eyre. Until this business of Black Hill blew up, I personally knew very little about mining. But my immediate reaction to it was extremely pessimistic. I had no doubt in my own mind at all that I was going to have a very unpleasant job of telling these people that their plan was quite hopeless. It was a most uneconomic pit. In fact, the difficulties were unlikely to be overcome. It wasn't enough to be a good plan. We'd got to prove it. Look, Mr. Gibson, your pits lost 50,000 a year for three years. The difficulties are geological. You can't get round that. We can do it, you know. Let me show you. They were at it for weeks. They got very much down to brass tacks. By the time they came back with the second and third attempt, I was very much impressed. The defense committee accepted it. And then the union bunch, after a final check by a mining engineer that used to manage Black Hill and knew the place inside out, we took no chances at all. Major Smale got cracking. This is no problem. Citizens for the meeting. The direction to Black Hill Colony is your problem. Citizens for the meeting. Give it all for tonight. This is your problem. Citizens for the meeting. Give it all for tonight. Economic threat to Bank Area. Black Hill Colony threatened. Come to the Citizens for the meeting. Thursday night. This is, is your problem. problem. Come, Come to, to the citizens' protest meeting in the hall on Thursday night. night. This, this is, is your problem. problem. 
It was a bitter night, and we'd got no idea whether folk would get away from the fireside or if they'd support the plan, even if they came. There aren't exactly a lot of agitators in Berwick. The biggest public meeting in living memory. Fellow citizens, this is the Gibson plan. It is based on local needs. It cuts out two miles of conveyors and steep gradients underground, thereby reducing power costs. Thirdly, the seam will be worked uphill, so the miner throws the coal downhill, with a reduction in fatigue and a consequent increase in production. Fourthly, Black Hill's troubles were partly caused by wages above union rates. They hereby undertake to work Black Hill on this basis. A. Redundant staff dispensed with. B. Day wagemen receiving bare union rates. C. Peace workers on rates low enough to keep costs below market value, provided nobody gets less than the minimum rate. D. They give a solemn undertaking to seek no increase which cannot be met out of profits. Fifthly, they agree to put it into effect through the coal board's composite agreement, so there are no extra wage costs even in the development period. It was accepted unanimously. Tommy could have his false breather for weeks. The press were their full strength again, and some of them were looking for gimmicks. The peace workers were going to pull their pay with the development workers under the composite wage agreement, a well-established principle throughout the industry. Everybody was to get union rates paid by the coal board. They've got it all backside first. Nobody was going to work for nothing. But once the papers put this idea out, the cards were stacked against us. Straight after these lurid headlines, union officials in Newcastle sent a very harsh letter commanding Gavin Drummer to appear before them. When he got there with a copy of the plan, they refused to look at it and wrapped him severely over the knuckle. They claimed it violated union principles, but they wouldn't say how. Two days later, Lord Lumpton was putting the plan to the coal board and asking for a reprieve. The very day he did it, the NUM London headquarters rejected it. Tragic, they said. They hadn't even looked at it again. The miners were let do at national level. What do they know about a little place like Black Hill? Their future was safe. They weren't going to close. At divisional level as well, they denied to the press that they'd cooperated with the coal board to murder Black Hill. Hey, we should want some convincing. Sir James Bowman wrote and said the scheme would violate national agreements. We asked him where. He answered by reiterating the same position. I can well understand why the miners' union is opposed to the plan. I must reject it as well. We haven't got an answer to that. The union made it easy for them. None of them would give us reasons. It got our goat. I discussed the matter with the chairman of the divisional coal board in public debate in another TV broadcast. I'm the Vicar of Squemiston. Closing of Black Hill would have a destructive effect upon family life and upon the community life of the village in general. Did the coal board stop to think about this before it decided to close Black Hill? It certainly stopped to think very seriously about it. It depreciated that the future in the mining industry for the men at Black Hill is comparatively small. That was seriously weighed against the necessity for cutting production and, more important still, making our industry more efficient to compete against oil. The suggestion is then, uh, Mr. Chairman, that the end justifies the means, and that's not very sound, is it, morally? I think it's absolutely sound. The weakest goes to war, I suppose. I'm afraid so. What was my lot after 48 years in the pit? Out of 210 pay packets, there were 14 days' notice in 160. The same notice slip for everybody. 
No explanation. Nothing about services rendered. And there was Harry Hope. I don't know how many years in the pit. He's been foreman blacksmith since 1926. 14 days notice. Tommy Mason. John Moffat. Tommy Richardson. The Defence Committee resolved the same night to send a delegation to the Ministry of Power. There were nine days to go when they set off, and they were told to emphasize we weren't against closure unconditionally. If it came to the worst, the pit should be run down slowly to allow the village to readjust itself after depending on coal for centuries. It looked as though we'd lost the welfare as well as the pit. It's no license for alcohol, like most of them are, and everybody goes there. <coughs> it's the center of the community. It's home from home for the old miners, old hands, They've been digging coal for 150 years and more between them. The miners built the place in 1911. They've kept it going ever since. Would the coal board subscribe to keep it going? If they didn't, it might have to finish. Lord Lumpton up in London saw things were getting desperate. Nearly a new pit. Council pressed to build houses. New machine put in. And suddenly they learn through unofficial channel their pit is to close. These miners, men of the highest caliber, produced a plan to run the pit economically. I have a copy here with me. Uh, oh. This profoundly sensible scheme was rejected by Sir James Bowman uh, and the Union. I find their uh, attitude uh, callous and incomprehensible. Are we to have gradual uh, and efficient closures of redundant pits or instant death sentences with no appeal? These miners want to work for six weeks without pay while their scheme is put uh, into operation. Let the Black Hill plan be tried. Even he got this wrong idea from the press that the miners were going to work for nothing. They went to the Board of Trade as well, before they came back, to point out that unemployment in Berwick is already about the worst in the country. could do was to walk and hope for the best. The village was peed up, waiting. Monday came and went, Tuesday and Wednesday. Thursday, still no news. On the Friday morning, when... 
We went to walk. We didn't know whether the pit was finished or not. We were waiting there for a telephone call before the end of the shift. If it didn't come, we were hewing the last call Black Hill would ever produce. Nothing happened, except that 160 of us go to our last packets. I was a very, very disappointed man on that 20th of February. I really thought we would get through. I couldn't see Black Hill being closed. Couldn't see it being closed. Black Hill has been bread and butter to me every day, night and day. I put all I know into Black Hill. That pit's full of coal and good machinery. It's all so much waste and so much scrap now. I cried when they told me the pit was closing because it's deprived a lot of people of their living. I, I think scammers and pit closing's an awful joke. I will say they made a good fight, but the NCB, them's the head ones now. They put it on. Tommy Gibson in charge of the demolition gang. Him, of all people. I felt very bad about it when I was told to salvage Black Hill. Having been in charge of the sinking, having tried to build Black Hill up to something, to be asked to pull it down, I felt very bitter about it. A few were lucky. Tommy Richardson got a job in the Ashton coal field. He could get home at weekends. We a bit of luck. Some of the young chaps went off to other coal fields. Yorkshire, Staffordshire, Nottinghamshire. It's no so easy when you're the wrong side of 50. I'm lodging in uh, Newbegin. A uh, good clean bed, everything up to the mark, with the exception that the home is missing. For most of us, though, the home was there. It was the walk that was missing. If I can possibly avoid it, I don't want to go back onto that door. You had three days at the pit and three in the door 19 years ago, and you felt you just for something that wasn't your own. Since nationalization, I didn't think for a minute that would ever be on the door again. It's really sorrowful to watch the men going about. The expression on their faces, it's pathetic. Men who have been active all their lives, suddenly having nothing to do. Harry Hope there couldn't sit doing nothing. No, after 35 years in charge of the workshops, just in the shed there, killing time. There's others as well as the miners beginning to feel the pinch. The payroll used to be 160,000 pounds a year. Some men with the initiative to go to his Yorkshire even didn't make the grade. Just to afford the cover it was, we uh, applied for a job at Doncaster. We'd been down there on a fortnight and just found we'd made a big mistake. Uh, conditions was vastly different to what we expected, what we'd been used to anyway. The heat, for one thing, seemed terrific. It used to give me a terrible headache, but I didn't like being in the high cold. It seemed more dangerous than working in a low seam. I have a heat rash on my face, as you can see, right? In a fortnight I was there, I lost seven pounds in weight. Of course, he lost his redundancy pay and his dole over this. 
Because they smashed the pit up. A wave of bitterness passed through the whole community. Across the stick in the country, when these lads goes away to the other pits, they turn and say, oh, they don't think willing to work for nothing. From the offset, it was definitely a washout. Only the hope the miners of Black Hill had something. A half loaf instead of a whole. I haven't time to bandy words with a man who simply fences with the question. We just never hear any more, and that's all about it. I, for one, will never go back into the pits. I've been 30 years in them, and to be dropped as useless. We had a grand full of women, and I had a great respect for them. He knew the pit outside in, and I'm sure I could have put that pit on the sound footing had they listened to him. The coal board have had the last word. The pit is closed. It was just as though the campaign had never been thought of. For us old ones, it looked like the end of the road. After 48 years in the pit, I've survived two strikes there and an explosion underground. I've never had a hair on my hand since. My first week's pay after I got married in 1921 was 18 shillings. We had to start building a house together on that. They talk about communications in the industry. The only communication between pits and headquarters is through the headlines in the press. It's a fine comment on a nationalized industry. 210 miners getting the sack through the papers and TV. is just the same in the Union. We might as well be on different planets. The man that closed the pit used to be the miners' union leader up here, before the war. It was Jim Bowman then. He used to have his dinner with the missus and me when he was up here. He spent half his time keeping coal on us from closing pits. Trying to, anyway. Aye, he's done a lot for the pitman. While he's been at the top, he's stacked the coal and kept the industry of short time. 35 million tons, they say. A bit different from the 1930s. Lord Lampton, he was trying to keep Black Hill going. He comes from one of the biggest coal-owning families in the North before nationalization. He's a true blue, but he was a good friend to us in the campaign. I wonder what the historians will say about that one. Trade unionists closing pits. Lord's trying to keep them going. They've created these vast organizations, but nobody knows how to control them. Of course, I'm only an old pitman, but that's how it seems to me. Mind, it was partly the man's fault as well. Some of them's just out for the money. It's got to come from both sides. There's been some happy times spent doing the pit of now. I've always been one for a practical joke, and some of them will not trust me to this day. Not an inch. I remember one time doing the pit. I bought a lot of starched cuffs and fancy waistcoats at a jumble sale. I gave a set to every man on the face. Sixteen men all walking away together. When we heard the manager was doing the pit, we all put them on. By the time he got in by, we were all shooing away with fancy cuffs and waistcoats and practically nothing else. He was a 
right thought of that, mind you, but he had to laugh. <laughs> he had to laugh. Another time, I gave them all laxative tablets and said they were sweeties. One chap shouted that he was paying that much, he would never eat pork on a Sunday name here. <laughs> I have been a councillor, a trade union president. Secretary for the Rechabites, Secretary for the Barn, I don't know what else. I've led a right full life, and now everything's finished. The prospects for the Lake of us are hopeless. They close the pit on economic grounds. Economics are all very fine, but what about all the other factors? If this place closes, the village is finished, but it will not close as long as we put the committee that we put at the present day. We will not close. We were still alive and kicking. Spring was in the air. Ronnie Wood was getting his old car ready for the off again. I should not call this day. This sort of thing gave me new heart, and I summarized the position in a letter to the guardian. It seemed the least I could do. One mark of true greatness is a readiness to admit error. No one has had the courage to stand up and say, it is conceivable that a mistake has been made. The BBC tonight team came up after this, and the powers that be began to weaken. Tommy Gibson remembered the old Aladdin drift and had the plans off the coal board before he could wink an eye. This drift was abandoned in 1908. It's full to the mouth, but if we can reopen it, 90% of the work is done for us. He went to a special meeting of the Defence Committee and then accompanied a delegation to the chairman of the Northern Division. Ha! Ah, they got a better reception this time. The press was sympathetic still. But again, publicity was a mixed blessing. Because by this time, we thought the drift was ours and Tommy was getting down to the technical problems in case we got the license. They multiplied daily. While Tommy was coping with this, the good news arrived. We've got the license. But it wasn't good for long. Some of us couldn't see where the money was coming from. Ten thousand pounds, they said. Where are working men going to get that amount of money? And who was going to manage the pit, even if they did? The question was, should the company have the license so we got jobs straight away, without any risk? Or else should we take a chance on getting much bigger rewards later, if we could find the capital and everything else and run it ourselves as a cooperative? The license will be in your name as secretary of, the, of this. Well, I don't know. It is not as the union. Secretary of what? The union. You will hold it as of the minor committee. Yeah. Would it not have been better to have the license issued in the name of the company? But for instance, anything should happen to Gavin, you might be left with a mine and no license. The defense committee couldn't sort it out at all, and the mass meetings weren't much better. There were hardly mass meetings anymore. Some of the men were that frustrated. The Elton Colby Company have come along. They will pay the same trade union rates and wages. They will employ the same black and labor. We've got to remember that we're doing this in face of a recession in the coal trade, which daily is getting worse. Every day we're increasing the chance of black hill coal being difficult to sell. Because you have a point of issuing a license to this so that the men can be employed. And if the men can't employ themselves because they can't raise the money, then surely the problem is solved if a company can take the license and employ the men. I mean, I hold no brief for the Elton Company, but I do a little brief for the miners of Black Hill, and they want, they want work. In the, in the name of the two or three individuals, they might have a traditional license of private companies, you know. 
And they have not to encourage Elson to get in very bad door. The Elson company clamped down. Deadlock. Something had to be done. I described to the chairman of the divisional coal board the plight they had left the village in. Most of the able-bodied men on the dole. Redundancy pay running out. The chairman wrote back the best news of the whole campaign. They were opening a new coal seam at Hillborough for 70 of all men. The whole village was as pleased as punch when they went off. TV was there to meet them. It's 36 miles away. They were laying transport on until they could finish building houses down there. What does it mean to you, this move? Any difference? Well, I don't think it'll mean much difference, you know, because we're all under the same union. We have the same agreements here as what we had at uh, Black Hill, you see. Do you have to uh, find your own transport to um, get here? No, no, the coal board subsidizes that. We only pay five shillings under an agreement was mm. made in 1952. I see. How long does it take you to get into work now from oh. Black Hill? Well, I think it's taken us over an hour to get here so far. Uh -huh. so and, how long did, about an hour and, a half. and how long did it used to take you when you worked locally uh, at Black about Hill? About 20 minutes. About 20 minutes. That's quite a, uh, big quite big a difference, big isn't big it? Difference, yeah. And what's your name? Thomas Gibson. I see. What do you feel about working here? Oh, I think it'll be all right. Uh, we're pretty good mixers, and uh, the type of fitmen that uh, are of Black Hill, I think they'll fall into the workings and the conditions at Shellbottle. Huh? Well, Mr. Leveland, you're the secretary of the Shellbottle Lodge. How do the local men feel about this influx of labor? Well, at first, some of the men weren't none too sweet on the idea because they thought that it would uh, jeopardize the future of the pits slightly and their own jobs. But the majority of us feel that it's no good talking trade unionism if we're not going to act it. Seventy more walking again, but that left a lot still on the dole for the winter. It was a hard winter as well. When the first few families moved into the new houses at Shellbottle, they weren't sorry, I can tell you. The men travelled 72 miles every day on top of a hard shift underground. As for the drift scheme, we got to the point where just about everybody, except the two union officials, wanted the licence handed over to the Elson Company. They'd got the capital to get on with it, but the union officials were hanging on. They reckoned it was a question of principle. There's only one way to get this licence business settled. Have an opinion poll and see what the miners say. That did it. It was overwhelming. The coal board agreed on the understanding Black Hill men were employed in the drift. And then, New Biggin Colliery underground. It was one of our chaps that was killed. Tommy Mason. I walked with old Tommy for years. He was a right canny chap. I've heard it said somewhere, there's always blood on the coal. <laughs> It's no joke reopening a flooded pit, I can tell you. You cannot just walk in. You've got to get plumbing permission first, to rig buildings and so on. And then there's power to be laid on. They even had to get permission to discharge all the water from the drift into existing waterways. It all had to go into a big settling pond first to avoid pollution. A complete waste, that. It's as clear as crystal. As soon as they got cleaned up a bit, and those modern pumps started mastering the water, Tommy came back from Shellborough to take charge. A bit different from the old steam pumps. As the water went down, he followed.
of course, you can't tell what to expect after all that time. Gas, potholes, roof down, else ready to come down. Supports were as good as the day they had been put in over 50 years ago. It was a miracle. Of course, man, it was hard work, dangerous as well. They had a nasty fall at one point. Himself, almost as much as he had come up on the pools. He's full of enthusiasm, but I think it's the first time he's been able to get cracking and try his ideas out underground. didn't regret their success, but we'd got resigned to spending the rest of our days on the dole. And then Matlock retired from the welfare and I got his job. I never thought I would walk again. On top of that, the welfare's been adopted as a community centre, so there's no danger of that closing now. very first call for 50 years come up. There was an extra pint or two scoffed that night.
Black Hill campaign taught us a thing or two. Now we'll teach them.